there archaeology that proves the Philippines is Ophir? Well, we certainly have seen some somewhere. Mm, gee, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, we've seen it in Solomon's Gold series. Oh, how about that? Yet again, we were falsely uh, accused of saying something in an interview that, well, we didn't say <laughs> regarding uh, a couple of U.S. interviews uh, where we actually cover a brief for an hour in one of them and even longer, a uh, couple hours in the other one. Uh, or more, each on our Ophir and Garden of Eden position. Do we make the full position there? Well, of course not. That's in the book, in the source book, and uh, also in over 100 videos in Solomon's Gold series. Uh, where, uh, in the interview, we actually even covered some archaeology. Huh? Uh, so, supposedly, we covered archaeology, but then said there is none? That's stupid. These aren't anything but scoffers who are willing to lie, to try to sensationalize a title to get views, especially on YouTube, uh, and still, they can't, <laughs> and that's sad for them, uh, because people see through this, that's why. However, it's time to address this more deeply. How do you test the geography of Ophir, the land of gold, as well as Sheba and Tarshish, and the Garden of Eden? I mean, how do you find it in the first place? Where do you even begin? Well, we've already shown from our very first video, in fact, which stands to this day. is very valid and very well done. Uh, basically, though, the garden is below in the same locale as the land of gold. It is the land of gold. It is within the earth underneath it. Well, this is the real question that numerous academics and scholars just dismiss uh, this because, well, they require, and this is typical uh, in such disciplines, they require us to find a city with a street sign that says Ophir, of course, and if you don't, you can't prove it's Ophir, right? I mean, talk about ignorance, willing ignorance, uh, as Second Peter 3 warned. We have to find the entrance to the Garden of Eden in order to prove what region in which it is located. You know, like a, like a theme park sign is supposed to be there, like, welcome to Disneyland, right? Or Disney World, or whatever it's called. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's supposed to say, welcome to the Garden of Eden. Here it is, right here. Uh, beware, terrible angels with flaming sword that turns in multiple directions. <laughs> it is, I mean, I, we haven't found that sign. We admit it. We, we just, we haven't found it. But it is an idiotic stipulation of those who don't even know the narratives. The question is, should there be a sign there? Was it ever created? Okay, now, that is on a very basic level, but this is the same with archaeology of cities. Really? For the Garden of Eden? They are uneducated, and they set a false litmus test. So, when you watch or read all the proof and are convinced, and then you go to your pastor or an academic with a wave of a hand. They say, no, uh, and that's really all they say. They haven't reviewed our position. They don't know it. They're uneducated on the topic. They certainly are not capable of debate uh, because they don't even know the position. It's just as Einstein or whomever uh, thought up the comment because it's credited to someone else in some areas, some credit him. We don't really care who said it, but the, the point is this is accurate. Noted, condemnation without investigation is the epitome of ignorance, and that, my friend, is truth. So let's deal with this now. How do you find the land of gold in the Garden of Eden? We're the ones who found it. That's us. We did. We prove it, and no one's been able to prove it wrong in more than six years now. So, hello. That's pretty solid. And we'll give you the method that has eluded academics and scholars, and that's why they never found it previously, and why they are unqualified to listen to what is a quick claim from someone, uh, a student, a parishioner, or whomever, uh, when we prove it, and they haven't reviewed the evidence in at all. And then they render an opinion, really, of, -uh. and that's it. See, that has no value 
And it's time to see past that. It's time to require them to earn their, you know, the letters after their name because they're supposed to be proving things and they don't. They're terrible at it. And we've proven that many times over. They do not know this topic. They're uneducated uh, and their opinion is of no consequence. Uh, so let's fix this now and we'll show you what we're talking about. I mean, think about it. If you had never heard of this and someone asked you, how do you find the land of gold? Would not your first answer be gold itself first in history and archaeology, etc.? Well, of course it would. And then uh, would you not go to the origin of the story? In this case, well, the Bible, as well as history that affirms it as we have. Well, we do, and you will not find a test anywhere as thorough as ours on this topic, especially not any Bible dictionary, nor any single Bible scholar, no rabbi, nobody has put into this what we have. And we've proven our position, and we know it. That's why we're so confident. But let's begin here. How many times does any biblical or historical reference ever define Ophir as having great architecture or any architecture for that matter at all? Is architecture even a note or a side note in any of these narratives? Yes, that is what they mean when they say archaeology. Typically, by the way, they want ancient civilizations. They ignore the archaeology of gold, but just want civilizations of who? Of Cain. The answer is zilch. Nada. Here they are on screen. All of the references that say there's great architecture in Ophir and the Garden of Eden. Not one we have ever found anywhere. And we've covered just about all of the accounts of Ophir, especially the origin in the Bible, First Enoch, Jubilees, even from uh, the Greeks and occult sources. We've covered so much, and yet not one says there's great architecture there. It's just not there. So why would you look for it? So before calling themselves academic, well, they need to behave academically, do they not? Uh, and they try to draw a conclusion to this false question that already fails. The question's wrong to start with. So they've already failed any test. They have no ability to test from there because they're already stuck in a box, a box that they put there themselves or someone trained them to put there. Uh, they should first educate themselves because they clearly have none on this topic in this regard. Let's just call it that. And this is why academics can't find Ophir. Let's just call it what it is. It's how they lost it and how they lost the Garden of Eden, which their discipline has because this was known and lost by them. Let's just call it what it is, their predecessors. Now that's sad, but hey, if the shoe fits. Now we don't look for great architecture nor ancient structures, not only because none are mentioned, but because this is the land of ancient Havila, named for Hava, Eve, where Adam and Eve and their righteous generations lived all the way up until Noah. Now, we proved that. Go back and watch those videos. Don't try to even attempt debate on this video on that because we're not proving it here. Um, the thing is, Adam didn't build anything. You won't find such scripture. Not even a house. Did you know that? He lived in a cave in several references. And let me tell you, there are luxurious caves in the Philippines, even now, that are paradise. No, he wasn't a caveman, but far smarter than that. Uh, and gee, is that why we find ancient bones in caves? Oh, how about that? Anyway, uh, basically... Man has regressed, not only in knowledge, but in lifespan. We know this because before the flood, they lived 900 plus years in most cases uh, in the Bible, at least the righteous generations, and yet not so anymore. Uh, you, you know any 900-year-olds? I, I don't. I, I, there are none, not on earth. Uh, the oldest woman is 122, which is right there where Yahuwah said he'd limit man's days to 120. So there you go. Now, it is, we have a video that covers that, too. Go watch it. Uh, we prove that out. It is hilarious how 
Modern medicine, medicine, in fact, claims to improve lifespans. It's just the sales pitch. Uh, data that they've proven to manipulate many times anyway. Yet most drugs actually, well, they do so. They may prolong life, uh, but they don't cure, which is what they're supposed to do. Uh, they prolong disease because, well, there's more money in doing things that way. Yet Adam lived 930 years. Have you done that, modern medicine? Because uh, we haven't seen anybody that old. Uh, so you want to try to make claims of godhood, which is what some are attempting. That's Let's just call a spade a spade. Uh, you ain't nowhere close to it. Let's just be clear. <laughs> when you get there, modern medicine, then you can start making claims of godhood, but that still won't work. You still wouldn't be, and you never will anyway. So drop the ridiculous pontifications and make yourself humble, realizing man has de-evolved and is not improving, and you aren't improving life either. Only the Creator can. They ignore the flood. They ignore the Bible, the entire paradigm. They ignore Adam, for that matter. Uh, and that only makes them ignorant, not smarter. Let's just call it what it is. Now wait, so when did man begin building cities? We said before, it's the paradigm of Cain. What did I mean? Well, with Cain, uh, the evil and his generations who mixed with fallen angels, uh, they are the first builders of cities according to Genesis 4 and Jubilees 4. There you go, two witnesses. Even Freemasonry and the occult uh, credits his family as their founder, the great architect and what are you seeking there, um, um, archaeologists? You're seeking the great architect in ancient cities that should not exist in Adam's righteous generations. This is a problem. This, this, is, this is going to cause someone's thinking to be twisted uh, from the very beginning. They have no foundation by which to even proceed. And that's why they never get out of the gate. And that's why you don't see any academics anywhere, no rabbis, no scholars, being able to prove what we have. Nor, in many cases, even being able to test it because they won't review it for themselves and they won't even learn the method because there is a scientific method here and we do prove a position. Uh, more than eight years now we've been working on this in research and no one can disprove our findings, so clearly we've done something right. Now, that's why we find Ophir and the Garden uh, and scholars and academics not only don't, but their paradigm is responsible for losing the land of gold and the Garden of Eden. Now, that's pretty bad to then claim to be experts on a topic that you lost the knowledge. Yeah. Uh, how does that work? Well, it doesn't work, and we reject it. They are not experts in this realm, and we have proven that overwhelmingly. They instead are looking for Cain, who wasn't in Havilah, but left to build the first cities in Nod, and no cities were built in ancient Havilah in any record, so they are spinning around in circles in their own little paradigm box and can't get out. And that's sad. This permeates the field of archaeology and other disciplines who demand such. They do this with the Bible all the time and say, if I can't find archaeology of this, then it didn't exist. But then archaeology turns up, such as in the case of David and Solomon, and there is a massive amount of it. And they just ignore it all and still say, if I can't find archaeology... Oh, wait, wait, wait. You mean you ignore all the archaeology that's been found and then claim to be credible on the topic? Are you kidding? You're not an academic when you do that. And there are several who do, who try to claim that Solomon and David never existed. Well, we deal with that in the first chapter of our book. Read it, and we prove, oh yeah, they did. And yes, there is quite a bit there proving that fact. And it's a lot for an ancient narrative as, as far back as that. It's incredible. So basically, in this narrative, we'll show you there are even archaeologists who do not agree with their paradigm. Not in this regard. Uh, because it's handcuffing ancient knowledge. And it shows that they don't even understand ancient gold mining. What do I mean? I'll show you. All right, before we begin, we've been asked this several times. You'd be surprised. How about this? 
How many mentions are there, biblically and historically, of golden temples to be found in Ophir, the land of gold? Yes, some have demanded such. Look, we aren't ancient aliens, and it's dumb to use their fraudulent techniques and boxes to apply to the Bible, which actually gives directions and descriptions that lead to these geographies. Duh. Once again, none. Not one. The Bible paradigm never built a temple until Solomon, so to go back thousands of years before his era and try to find one is illiterate. It's like saying you are an airplane pilot because you saw a hangar one time. Uh, it's illiterate. Anyone demanding such is not seeking the truth. Let's just call a spade a spade, and they'll never find it, period. And more so, they are unqualified to listen to a quick, the Philippines is Ophir, and reject it, having never reviewed the case, which is what happens often. And we had an interview. We were asked this question. Is there archaeology of the Garden of Eden? That was the question. Hmm. Now, this is going to be a home run. Let's smash this now. What are they looking for? Fruit? What archaeological signature would the Garden of Eden leave behind in any narrative whatsoever? Uh, well, none. <laughs> it's a garden that was planted at creation and enclosed within the earth. You can't even get there. First, you have to enter it. And there are no structures there because, well, it needs none. And there is no record of any. Adam didn't build anything there. Adam doesn't build. He is not a Freemason. See? We can't enter, however, nor can they, because, well, Yahuwah placed at least two terrible cherubim there to guard it with a sword that turns in every direction. You ain't getting in, and neither are we. In other words, no one. Yes, Enoch was able to enter because the angels ushered him in, and he lives there, and we cover that uh, in great detail. Uh, watch Where Did Enoch Go? It's a fabulous video. And that includes, by the way, Satan and his whole paradigm of demons. Uh, they can't get in. They can't enter. It is the Holy of Holies of Yahuwah. Understand that. So they would, you know, uh, they wouldn't be able to enter anyway. Uh, they can't get that close to his presence. So what are these scoffers looking for? A manufactured lie of great architecture. That's what they want. They want ancient cities that they can't be found because there are None. The other areas where you do find ancient cities it just proves that Nephilim and Cain's lineage live there because that's their paradigm. See, so we're looking for Cain in Adam, and that's not very bright. It means they're uneducated on this topic. There's none to find, and there shouldn't be any, and the entrance is hidden. Duh. So why do they even think uh, you know, that, that they could possibly prove something with uh, a false paradigm from the start that can't even get out of the gate. Well, they don't want to. That's the thing. They're extremely ignorant on this topic. That's what, and we've proven it, well proven it in this series. So what does the land of gold, which is the land above the Garden of Eden, one and the same, and even gold mining in antiquity, leave behind scientifically, let's go to science here, as an archaeological signature. Archaeologists know better, yet some, even archaeologists, demand something their own discipline knows better than to look for in requirement because, well, there is none. Let's see. Let's ask an archaeologist from their publishing in Archaeosciences, a journal, uh, most of the gold in the prehistoric and early historic periods, you know, like Ophir and King Solomon's era, that's what we're talking about here, would, however, undoubtedly, got that word there? See that? Have been extracted by panning alluvial sediments. Now, and the Philippines, by the way, certainly has alluvial sediments uh, in, in abundance and had that uh, even historically recorded, but far before, better than that, really. Uh, we'll show you. Uh, history records gold on the ground and just below the surface even, not even just panning in streams. 
Alluvial gold deposits. That's the key. That's why South Africa fails. Because South Africa uh, is, you know, its gold is very deep in the ground. And what does one need to be a gold miner uh, with uh, when gold is in the shallows of streams and sitting on the ground and just below the surface? Well, really? I mean, do we even have to answer that question? Should we really have to explain this to academia and scholars? I mean, evidently we do, but we shouldn't have to. Think. A technique requiring little capital investment in equipment and no specialist technology. But unfortunately, leaving, what's that word? No, not even a little, none, discernible archaeological signature. So why are you looking for something that can't even be there? Wow. We all know what none means, right? (laughs) All these sources are in our source book for the search for King Solomon's treasure. We mentioned this and use this quote actually in the book, but you can download the ebook free and the source book at ophirinstitute.com. It's there. Uh, so before looking for something called archaeology in fraud and a blind paradigm of ignorance, which is what academia represents on this topic from what we have found thus far uh, of this ancient process, one needs to understand what it even is before you can move forward. They do not. At least not the ones claiming to know better than all this massive research proves. They can't disprove it, so they just ignore it and say, Nuh-uh, well, that doesn't work, sorry. You need to earn your pay there, academic. Uh, Because, well, that's academic, don't you know, to just say, (laughs) Nuh-uh. Yeah, even a child knows better, we know this. Academics and scholars will go, well, they'll try to go deep within the earth, historically, based on modern thinking, very backwards, uh, and try to find the land of gold, which did not dig that deeply in the earth. But why are they looking in the wrong place? They even start on the wrong foot. There's no way they're going to find it because they are ignorant of the paradigm. Uh, They haven't even begun to search, and they won't. They'll stay in their box, and they'll just say, nah uh and we find this on many topics. They are the blind leading the blind. Gold panning and seeking in the shallow ground requires what? A hand? Maybe a basket? I mean, really, again, nothing that leaves an archaeological signature. So why are they even thinking in terms of that? And the Garden of Eden, even less. I, what are you looking for? Uh, an enclosed garden that you can't enter. And you want archaeology from that? Really? I, you don't even know the narrative. You don't know anything. So don't pretend that you do. That's all. Now, some of these things will be review. Some of these will be new. But check this out. This is from Investing News. Alluvial mining is an old technology, indeed, the most ancient, really. That's how they used to mine for gold back in the days of Solomon and before, uh, because they couldn't dig deep into the earth, at least not too deep. Uh, There was gold mining in Egypt. There were some places that had it, but the amount of gold required to be Ophir is far more than Queen Hatshepsut. Put, however you say her name, <laughs> produced in her entire uh, you know lifetime. So um, it's just not it's not there, and she's she's credited as you know one of the most famous uh, for gold mining. So, but it's still fairly common today. Uh, some mining companies use the technique, though it's more often done by artisanal miners. In other words, people independently doing it on their own in regions such as Africa and South America. Of course, they leave off the Philippines, uh, the number two that really should be on the list. Yeah, but they do that all the time with just about everything. Uh, the Philippines is ignored often. Uh, and believe me, the Philippines, most certainly we could go through clip by clip by clip, even news reports uh, of miners up in the mountains who are panning for gold and even risking their lives to do so. Uh, We won't ignore the Philippines. These alluvial deposits are formed when minerals are eroded from their source. So that's how it works, okay? They, They come down the mountains, 
uh, you know, and, and through rivers, streams, uh, and yes, in the case of the Philippines, some even on land and just below the surface. Then transported by water to a new locale. So water is, is what typically moves them. However, in the Philippines, the ancient land of gold, we're going to show you a couple of references. Uh, again, some of its review and uh, that just to support this video. These alluvial deposits arrive uh, at a whole different level in the Philippines and require a different thinking supported by historical evidence as fact. Now, we're going to show you that. And we're going to prove that. You'll see. However, let's be clear. The Philippines, after more than 3,000 years of a gold rush, really, uh, is still number two on all of Earth in gold reserves. Uh, in the ground, untapped, that's what we're talking about. That's the report that matters. And that's according to Forbes magazine in this report. Uh, now, it's not talking about Yamashita, you know, legends or other things like that, where Japanese buried gold in the Philippines. It, it's, none of that's included. It's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a scientific analysis worldwide by the Fraser Institute in Canada, the experts on this, who are, I mean, they are the foremost experts. Uh, and it is their determination that the Philippines is number two in untapped gold in the ground, period. Yes, you can go look it up on Google and find gold production reports that won't say that. Well, that's impertinent. It has nothing to do with anything. We're trying to find who has the gold in the ground. These basically sit under the ground, untapped, according to this report. This is not talking about gold production, which is impertinent. Again, the question for the land of gold is who has the most gold in the ground. Now, South Africa is number one, and we'll address that as well, because, well, it's disqualified from history. So, sorry, doesn't work, which makes Philippines number one. The New York Times, we've covered this, also reports the same Philippines, number two in gold in the ground, untapped on all of Earth, Again, with South Africa as number one, but again, disqualified, you'll see. And ever heard of King Solomon's copper mines? A lot of, a lot of people try to throw that out there. That's all they're looking for is his copper mines. There's a whole list of resources, by the way. Gold is by far the, the for, foremost. Uh, we go through all the resources on this channel. So we've tested them all, and we're not finding scholars uh, who've who've actually done that, which is really, I mean, why, why wouldn't you begin there as a foundation? But they'll talk about his copper mines, his copper mines, his copper mines. You'll see it all over the place. Well, uh, <laughs> that's not actually in the Bible. The Bible doesn't say anything about copper mines of King Solomon. That's an occult legend. However, even so, the Philippines leads the world in copper number one. How about that? Uh, Villegas actually published in Banco Central's uh, hardcover coffee table book. Uh, that's the central bank for the Philippines, by the way. Uh, they published it and actually pulled it from the shelves and from print completely, even uh, even from uh, CD, uh, all gone uh, ever since we cited this. How about that? Um, don't know why. We can only speculate, but it was kind of weird that we even sent the money to buy uh, and they kept the money and never sent us the book or the CD. Hmm, how about that? Good job there, Banco Central. Anyway, so we were able to affirm elsewhere. Uh, now, this isn't uh, gold in the ground. This is gold production and output. Uh, and if one assesses that properly by square kilometer, well... According to Banco Central, again, they pulled it from the shelf, so they maybe don't want us to know this anymore, but it was there, and we've documented that. The Philippines was still recorded as number two in gold output in modern times per square kilometer. How about that? Even in 1941, the Philippines was the world's uh, fifth largest uh, gold producer. Again, that's gold output, not gold in the ground. And again, that, that isn't really the story. But still, even so, uh, as small as the Philippines is in comparison to countries like, well, China, who makes these reports. Uh, but China's 30 times larger 
than the Philippines. So that's not apples to apples. I mean, these aren't apples to apples measures in that regard. However, what matters is not gold production as much as gold untapped sitting in the ground still and the history of gold mining, which the Philippines has, uh, we've covered, goes back to uh, even before 1000 BC uh, with even items found uh, from the Philippines, uh, even trading cross uh, regionally with Taiwan, uh, with Vietnam. Uh, items have found from the Philippines uh, in archaeology. We've shown you in science journals. It's all in our book. Uh, the data's there. Let's remember the number one South Africa. Well, first is not an island. And we covered last video. It has to be, according to scripture uh, and the accounts of uh, even that's of Ophir or in Greek, Christ, uh, which is an island in pretty much every assessment. Uh, Ptolemy is the only one that changed it to a peninsula. Uh, you, you could say in fraud, uh, but it was because the furthest he could see on a map in terms of uh, geography at that time was really to Burma. He couldn't even see the Malay Peninsula. He thought the Indian Ocean was enclosed. He knew nothing about the tens of thousands of islands in the Pacific and Southeast Asia especially. So uh, let's, not, let's not claim that he knew anything of great pertinence in that regard and certainly didn't have the information to change what is an island in massive uh, numbers of accounts in history and in the Bible uh, to a peninsula, which is just, again, ignorance. It's also in Ham's territory, and, well, that's wrong. Whoops, Africa's not in Shem's, and it has to be in Shem's because Ophir is an actual person in the Bible, and he's from Shem. He's a brother named Sheba, and Sheba is from Shem, the right Sheba. Not the wrong Sheba, Sheba in Africa, which is Ethiopia, uh, basically, Cush uh, did have a uh, you know a lineage of a Sheba, and that's the wrong Sheba. And the story that comes from there is an occult lie, uh, where that queen of Sheba has the legs and hoof of a goat. <laughs> now that is bad, right? It's in the wrong direction, with absolutely zero history of being the land of gold historically. It just doesn't fit. And we showed you in, uh, I believe it was the last video, I'm pretty sure, uh, that in fact, uh, even though there are two places named in recent times by the British in absolute utter fraud, Ophir in South Africa, of course there were like 16 across the earth, uh, that all named in the British Empire, imagine that, because they're out there just trying to seek confusion. None of those are Ophir, they all fail. The only thing that is Ophir and was named Ophir in history, historically, in writing, Ophir and Christ, on maps even, uh, from very ancient times, uh, is, well, the Philippines. It fits. South Africa doesn't. But far worse, check this out. In fact, in the archaeological record, according to the University of Cape Town, that's in South Africa, folks. That's a South African source telling you this in academia. Hello. Gold doesn't even show up in South Africa in the archaeological record until 1000 A.D. Did you hear that? That's 2,000 years after King Solomon. It is a laughable assertion uh, as the ancient Ophir. And even the British claim uh, that they went to Ethiopia and found, you know, items dated to what? 200 AD, 1200 years after the Queen of Sheba lived and was not from Africa. It is not proof of anything in this regard. In fact, what it is proof is that that land is not a fit. That's what it proves. The Minerals Council of South Africa affirms this as well. There you go. Concerning the gold rush in South Africa, and it would have had to have gold rushes in 1000 B.C. to fit King Solomon's narrative, it didn't even begin until 1884. There is none recorded prior period. Little more than a century ago. 
And some actually try to assert that that could be the ancient Ophir of 1000 BC. Really? Uh, they're only off by 3,000 years? That's all uh, kind of close, though, huh? This leaves the Philippines as number one in all of history, as it's still number two of untapped gold in the ground to this very day. In fact, not only does the Fraser Institute rank the Philippines as number two in untapped gold in the ground, it also ranks it as one of the five most mineral rich, that's all minerals, in the world. Wow. Now, Again, that's all minerals, and when you look at this list, the other four ahead of it, or also within the top five, uh, they're at least four times its size or larger. So it's not even an apples-to-apples -apples measure either. Truly, the Philippines is number one, really, uh, per square kilometer. However, the Philippines is placed at the bottom of the list for investment for gold mining, which again has nothing to do with being the land of gold or not. It has to do with a whole lot of other reasons. This is important to understand, and academia needs to learn how to research, uh, because they'll use this to beat up on the Philippines, uh, not even knowing what they're talking about. Why is this? Let's show you. Realize, we had uh, a viewer who was uh, very intent, uh, especially working with the youth, uh, they were involved in several platforms in social media uh, regarding history, and they started teaching uh, about Ophir and the references, and, uh, well, they got banned from those forums because academia will not even hear of the word Ophir. They will not, will not, will not, will not. Well, that's just willing ignorance, that's all. Investing News tells us mining gold in the Philippines can be difficult today. This is recent times. Uh, the country's mining sector remains largely untapped, and much of that has to do with political turmoil and controversy. So understand, without going into any details or speculation as to who, what, when, why, where, uh, doesn't matter. The point is the Philippines ranks on the list. Uh, it should as the land of gold, not gold production, though. Okay? And here's why. It still ranks there with a true assessment. But we don't need this. We don't need it to show on mining gold reports for production. The report that matters is untapped gold in the ground. Number two on all of Earth, the Philippines today. And that makes number one in history because South Africa, as we showed you, is disqualified numerous times, numerous ways, uh, from being the historical Ophir. Additionally, let's go back to the direct evaluation that should be used. Alluvial gold deposits. Now, what does history say about alluvial gold deposits? Gold sitting on the ground or in shallows in the Philippines? Oh, this is good. In Antonio Pigafetta's journal about 1521, as he traveled with Magellan, says of the Philippines, uh, when they first came on the first journey, that which is most abundant is gold. That was the icon of the Philippines. Understand that. It wasn't initially. At first, they were holding their gold back, and people weren't really showing them. And then the reports become overwhelming. Everywhere they go, there's gold. So, here he says, they showed me, okay, so he was an eyewitness, understand that, certain valleys, he didn't say mountains, he said valleys in this instance, okay, valleys of gold, hmm, now that's interesting, that is not the paradigm of most of academia who's looking for the gold in the mountains, yet the Philippines still passes in that regard, making signs that there was more gold there than hairs on the head. That's a lot of gold. This part of the islands called Chipit is the same land as Butuan and Calagan. So somewhere near Butuan was this place, this valley called Chipit, uh, probably to the west of Butuan, likely, though we, we don't completely know. Notice he observed this as an eyewitness. This is called valid, credible history, folks. 
He actually saw this. He saw valleys of gold and then shares their description of how numerous it was. It was a lot. And not in the mountains, in the valleys. Doesn't mean the mountains don't still have it. Yes, they do. But this was a valley of gold, which means the gold was on the ground. And actually, he says, or just below the surface. And he tells the story a little further, especially that which is below the surface. They didn't have the tools to get it out of the ground. But it was not deep in the mountains. It was a valley of gold. Wow. And this was still in 1521, 2,500 years after Solomon, the Philippines still had massive alluvial deposits of a greater, broader description than just in the shallows uh, of the streams. Wow. Just in the ground, just below the surface. How about that? Picofetta also observed and recorded this history, right? I mean, you don't get more valid than Antonio Pigafetta. Uh, and he's really, he's the only eyewitness uh, to what the Philippines was uh, when the Spanish came. Uh, he came with Magellan, and he was his historian, and he wrote this stuff. So uh, this is fact, folks. In the island belonging to the king who came to the ship, this is the king of Butuan, uh, there are mines of gold, which they find in pieces as big as a walnut or an egg, a chicken's egg, a nugget of gold, that's pretty big, by seeking in the ground. That's not talking about massive equipment to mine gold deep, which the Philippines didn't have and shouldn't have, yet it was the land of gold. How is that? Because the gold was far easier to get to. It was sitting on the ground, it was close to the surface, and it was in the shallows of the streams and rivers. Seeking in the ground does not require massive mining equipment, so to look for it is rather ridiculous, is it not? These are alluvial deposits. That is the key here, and this is huge. Valid Credible archaeology. What? Yes, this is archaeology of gold by the king of Butuan who handed it to Magellan. There you go, as a gift. That's what this is. So yes, there is valid archaeology of the right kind of archaeology in the Philippines indeed. There are also ancient legends passed down orally in the Philippines. No, that's not considered uh, historical by many, which is rather stupid because it is historical. Uh, but cut them some slack. The Spanish destroyed the rest of their history and writing, so all they had left is some oral stuff, which even a lot of that was wiped out because if there was anyone sharing the oral stuff, well, they just killed them. So... That's a fact, um, and it all happened on Spain's watch. Spain was in control. So whether anybody can produce the Jesuits burned uh, the documents or not is illiterate. Why do we need their admission that they did so? The point is they were there because this was illiterate people reading and writing when the Spanish came, and somehow whatever they were reading and whatever they were writing disappeared on your watch there, Spain and Pope. So you are responsible, period. In both of these legends, the characters collect gold from the shallows. This is, of course, in streams, rivers, or it says the sea, but whatever. Uh, it very well could be the sea as well. So, you know, gold could, could make its way into the sea, certainly. And there are shallow, shallow areas that could happen. Uh, in ancient times, uh, because the Philippines has always been rich in alluvial deposits. There you go. Uh, it also happens to lead the world in untapped gold in the ground, even still today, number two on all of earth, which means number one in all of history. And it has the, not just legends, but actual credible, valid history to support it. Wow. And there's far more than we'll cover in this video. This is a YouTube video. We can only go so far, but we've just watched the series. We've covered this. Or better yet, read The Search for King Solomon's Treasure. It's free in ebook at OphirInstitute.com. In 1590, these historical Filipino figures were illustrated in what they call 
uh, today the Boxer Codex, which is a terrible recent name. It actually is named for a professor in Illinois who was able to get a hold of the copy from, I guess, the British or whoever. But the point is, it is valid history. Its track is, is there. Uh, and it, it does date to 1590. Filipinos wore a massive amount of gold on their persons in these illustrations. Uh, and we also see the supported by history, especially from Spanish general Lavazeris, who defines uh, as so many, they were so many, so, so uh, many they were innumerable or could not be numbered in this class of people. And even classified the, the amount of gold that they wore on their persons. We've covered this and it's in the book, so everything's there, it's in the source book. Uh, equivalent to about 1.5 to 1.8 million U.S. dollars today that this class of people wore on their person in public in gold. Wow. Imagine that. Well, that's really not a surprise in the land of gold. Now, is it? Anywhere else on earth? Well, you won't even find such legends. Um, and by the way, this isn't just a legend. This is historic fact. Uh, not only recorded his, uh, historically several times, but also recorded uh, and, and illustrated in this Boxer Codex, and we'll show you in a second, affirmed in archaeology. Uh, but De Morga 1609 talks about this as an historian affirming this as well. He tells us, De Morga, that this is very ancient gold. This is important and something that uh, even the uh, Ayala Museum uh, disregards, they, they forget about it when they date things because they can't actually date gold, uh, can't do it. So, uh, But ancient gold handed down from the ancestors in antiquity. So this is very ancient gold. This is a very ancient practice in the land of gold. Essentially, every Filipino once owned a significant amount of gold. Again, Lavazaris lays that out in three different classes of people we perceive, uh, all drawn in the Boxer Codex as well, uh, and we cover that. Watch those videos. Then, this is affirmed in archaeology as fact. Here's a clip from the video from the Ayala Museum of the Surigao Treasure Find, just real quick, a uh, couple minutes. Uh, from the 1980s uh, is when the, the treasure was found, uh, somewhere in there uh, or so. Uh, and these pieces that you see illustrated were found and affirmed in archaeology. They're rare pieces, and it's very hard to miss this. The Boxer Codex is not wishful thinking nor a fairy tale. It is fact because the Philippines is the land of gold. We dare you produce another. You will not. Isuot ang sacred thread para madama ang bigat nito. Itong tinatawag na sacred thread, ang pinakaimportanting pyesa ng gold collection ng Ayala Museum. Halos apat na kilo ang timbang nitong gintong sablay. Wow! Uy, napakabigat. Uy, magkakakalo ka nito. <laughs> ang bigat. <laughs> And we're going to wrap this up here, but let's uh, just go through this real quick. You can see this very rare piece, the sacred thread that you just saw in the video, uh, found in the Surigao treasure, is a match to what is illustrated in 1590. That's fact, folks. The pieces are dated uh, to at least 1000 AD, which is, again, uh, really ignoring the ancient tradition of handing down uh, that uh, De Morga depicted in 1609 uh, from their ancestors, from antiquity, or in other words, very ancient. Uh, you can't actually date gold, uh, so when they date it, they're dating it by the pottery uh, that it was found uh, in or around, uh, which is no surprise that that pottery would be there, and that that household may have been dated back to about 1000 AD. Or so, but the gold is not. It's far more ancient, and De Morga tells you so. The famous Shebu collar, likely named for Cebu and found in Egypt as well, originated in the Philippines. Uh, and yes, we cover history on that as well. Uh, illustrated in 1590, and here we have it in archaeology. Full circle, proven. 
The gold dagger handle is also a match uh, in archaeology with the one pictured in 1590. Here you go. And the belt of fine gold, a very rare piece uh, found in the Surigao treasure, is a match to the one illustrated in 1590. There you are, full circle proven fact, folks. Only the land of gold could produce this, and there's so much more we cover. Uh, this is really a brief of such to address the archaeological uh, issue. Uh, and here you go, the Philippines fits. Uh, no other land does, and no other theory survives the shallowest of tests, in fact, and we rip through those, so go back and watch the whole series. The Philippines emerges as the only option for the ancient land of gold. Watch the series, see for yourself. However, the largest point in this regard is the Bible defines this land of gold not by great architecture, not by golden temples, no golden men, or the many nonsensical fictional tales of El Dorado and other lands of gold out there, which are all fiction and fraud. Uh, those are fake stories. No, this is the actual biblical land of gold found and affirmed in archaeology, even in Israel. In fact, we covered that in the first video, and we know this firmly especially by the resources of which all must be found there, and they are. By the criteria set forth, and the Philippines is 100% the only one left standing, as all else fails. So we tested the resources. That's archaeology of resources, by the way. Uh, so yes, there is a mega archaeology on uh, this topic, uh, and that's on top of all of the archaeology we covered, supported by history, the Bible, science, geography, linguistics, etc. But check out this two minute brief clip on our resource uh, test. It's a quick, uh, it's also in her book. The full resource test with sources is published in The Search for King Solomon's Treasure, a 384-page book uh, supported by a 300-page source book. And we covered it in this series as well, uh, especially Part 1D, by the way. Uh, you can watch that in Solomon's Gold series. The Philippines is the land of gold. Because it matches every description, every reference, every resource, has the history, no one else does, the credible geography in and close to that era, and all the way to recent times even. Uh, and no one else has this. 
has the gold no one else does, except South Africa, who fails on so many other levels. There is no comparison and no debate whatsoever. The Philippines is the ancient land of gold, Ophir, Sheba, and Tarshish, which is the land of gold above the Garden of Eden. Watch our very exhaustive uh, positions, uh, Solomon's Gold series, uh, our uh, Garden of Eden series, our Rivers from Eden series, and read our exhaustive publishing of the search for King Solomon's treasure, free an ebook and supported by a 300-page source book of historical references, also free at ophirinstitute.com. Uh, we also went into ancient texts such as First Enoch, Jubilees. We've mapped out the geographic directions, the oldest mapping of the world by Noah, a really a fairly complete map of the world, at least uh, generally, uh, and even Enoch, who maps portions of the earth, and they indisputably both lead to the Philippines as a land above the Garden of Eden. We dare anyone to review the full case and even think about debating. You will not. The few who have tried have looked incredibly foolish, though we have had numerous folks contact us to tell us they set out to prove it wrong and could not. They were honest people. And the agitators, well, they aren't actually seeking the truth anyway, so who cares what they have to say? And that includes academics who love willing ignorance, especially on this topic, and they sit in their seat uh, of, of you know, scoffing, a paradigm of stupid, ignoring proof, to continue to placate the very conquerors who came to bear the fruits of their god, Satan, killing, stealing, and destroying from John 10.10. 10. How about that? Anyone attempting debate of these findings based on this video, which we aren't proving here, uh, you know, our position is proven over many uh, and over a book. It's, a, and it's an extensive, exhaustive position. You will be muted for trying to do so here. Our channel, our rules. No debate in ignorance. That wastes everyone's time. And you aren't doing that to us. Debate is fine. You'll lose on this topic, but attempting such without reviewing this exhaustive case, well, that's not debate. you got to be kidding. That's just ignorance, and you can keep that to yourself. You will review our position and then go ahead and try. Few do. If you have not, we encourage you to do so. These findings will change your life and perspective. So, the Philippines is the ancient land of Ophir and the Garden of Eden, period, we prove it. Thank you. We have over 470 videos on this channel, one for every day of the year plus now. Uh, many just as profound with some 50 or so in Tagalog for Filipinos and now six in Spanish to start. We also have been setting up subtitles for 20 plus languages for most of our videos. Don't forget to like and subscribe and click the bell for notifications of new uploads. Join our email list as YouTube fails to notify often. And we will notify you ourselves at thegodculture.com. Just fill in the pop-up there. We now have alternative platforms for videos on Rumble, Odyssey, and Utreon. And our new podcast is available for all of our videos pretty much as well. All links in the description box and friend us on Facebook at The God Culture, space hyphen space, original. That is our only Facebook page, only one that we're checking and using. Uh, if you prefer an alternative, we now have Parlor and Gab, links below. We have six books published internationally, being read in over 100 countries. Uh, and actually, I correct that, it's now seven. How about that? Uh, with our new release, the first book of... Bible History Illustrated, Enoch's Animal Dream Visions. We also have now launched Ophir Philippines Coffee Table Book in the U.S., Canada, U.K., and many overseas markets on Amazon, and it's available in hardcover or softcover there. Also, this uh, first book of Bible History Illustrated is available only in color. We're not even doing this in black and white. Only in color, and you can get it in color, uh, softcover, or hardcover on Amazon. Uh, coming to the Philippines soon. Not yet. We're not there yet, but we will get there. Additionally, we launched the Book of Jubilees, the Torah calendar, with color maps and interiors, as so many had requested that overseas, uh, rightfully so. 
uh, we already have that in the Philippines. Uh, the Philippine copies have color maps inside already. Uh, that too is available on Amazon in hardcover, softcover, both in color or in black and white softcover if you wish. Uh, all books, including Solomon's Treasurer, are now free in ebook. Uh, we're not going to do an ebook for this one because we have this video series animated and we're going to release one with all five uh, as one video as well. So no need to do an ebook when we'll have the video animation. Uh, more coming soon. Thank you for watching. Now always remember, prove all things for yourself. Yah bless to everyone.